Hello, welcome. Thanks for joining us. And welcome to another session of Ask the Trainer. And we're delighted you could be here with us. And we're also delighted to have the training team from Maxon with us. So hi, Dr. Sassy. Hi, Ellie. Hi, Nick. How are you all doing? Good. And we're extra delighted to be joined by another member of the Maxon training team, Athanasios Pazantzis, so AKA Noseman, who you may well know very well from his multiple tutorials he's recorded over the years. So welcome, Thanasis. Hello, everyone. Um, Thank I have you. screen envy, by the way, from your, from your setup. <laughs> Always. I still need to install a few more. There's always, you can't have enough monitors in the background. That's what I've realized. There's, there, absolutely. <laughs> you, you can't have too few, too many. So we, we're not going to be doing too much housekeeping at the beginning here because I wanted to release as much time as possible for this session. Um, as usual, Ask the Trainer is a largely unstructured session where you can ask us any question about all the Baxon tools and in fact about related workflows and we'll do our best to answer them. But you'll have noticed that in recent months we've been doing a theme. So today we are in conversation with Thanasis because we've got a theme about recording tutorials and also um, applying to become a certified artist and in fact a certified trainer and uh, we we're recording this session and um, so if you've got any questions that you want to ask that aren't directly related to training absolutely please ask those as well and chuck those on the questions area and we'll answer those in the background and we may well have time at the end to address some of them but the we'll answer them somehow and if we don't get around to it, please let us know. Training at maxon.net comes through to us, and then we can answer those questions too. But we were, we're so fortunate to have Thanasis uh, making these tutorials for Cineversity, which he's done for many years. And he's been very generous in sharing his knowledge about how to do this. And in fact, just as a reminder about where we're recording this, they, here we go. We have our Maxon training team on YouTube. And if you go onto the video section, in fact, you can see here already, he's recorded a series of tutorials. Here's one about everything you wanted to know about certifications, but also there's a wonderful series that he's recently recorded about how to make tutorials. And that's a good hour, and that's more than an hour, probably almost an hour and a half worth of content. So we'll be talking a little bit about that and, and that whole process as we go through. And then also the, the usual thing, go and, go and have a look at the Maxon website. If you go under the new section events, you see all the amazing stuff we've got coming up, including Ellie's course on beginning C4D and also Nick's course on particles. So yeah, I couldn't not plug you both since you're here. But anyway, um, but also if you go onto the learn page, we'll be talking about this later on, the certification page where we have all sorts of wonderful information about this certification thing, which we'll be talking about in this hour. And just finally, just quickly, if you want to find out more about Thanasis, you can go to Noseman no, or Noseman.org, where you can find his links to the social media and also his wonderful YouTube channel as well, where you drop all those really interesting tutorials about the sort of putting together the techniques that you wouldn't necessarily have thought of. So that, that's the general plan for today. So the, please, if you've got questions about the theme, and in fact, anyone else, anyway, just shout them out. So, um, Thanasis, what, what, what are we having from you? What are you going to share with us today? Well, welcome to the Noseman Show. <laughs> Basically, yes. Yeah, and, uh, yeah, you did a good job uh, you know, stroking my ego. I love that. That's why you're one of my favorite people, uh, Simon. So, everyone else, watch and learn. Now, when we talk about discussion with me, that means that I do the talking, you do the listening. So, let's uh, just uh, get that out of the way. One more detail is that for the things, the tutorials I've uh, recorded for Maxon, they're playlists. So don't go around scrambling for tutorials. If you go to the playlist in the YouTube channel of Maxon Training, you'll find playlists for the um, tutorial making and the certification, so you don't have to scramble around. Uh, Michelle did a great job and put those playlists together. And uh, yeah, oh, look at me. I love to watch my tutorials for some odd reason. So uh, today we are going to tackle uh, two topics. And of course, um, the floor is open for questions or anything like that. Then the, the first part is going to be about creating tutorials, uh, the value and certain key points, uh, the details, technical details, you probably find in the tutorial series I've done. Um, but we're sort of, sum we're gonna summarize this in the first half. The second half, we're gonna talk about the new certification process that 
Maxon has introduced, which is actually something that uh, Maxon has been working on for over two years. It's not something we just uh, came up with. And uh, a lot of people have worked on that and a lot of effort has gone into it. And I'm going to explain a few things. So let's, um, barring any questions on procedure, um, let's uh, get started with uh, tutorial making. So um, any question, anyone? Um, let's see, anyone from the panel? Any questions? No, nothing. I, I, I have a question. I yes, have a question. please. My I, friend so, Nick. So, Thanasis, yeah, I watched the first video um, that you did in the tutorial series. I haven't seen the rest of it. And one of the things that I was curious, because you've been doing the tutorials for a number of years, uh, I was just trying to think about your own personal experience. So, my first part to your question is what is the most difficult tutorial series that you ever had to work on, and how do you overcome it? Uh, very good question. It saddens me that I give you a compliment, but that's a very good question. Uh, with Nick, <laughs> we have a very, we're, we're very good friends, actually, within the, the same country. Luckily, Canada is very, very large, so we sort of mitigate that problem. Uh, he's a neighbor. He lives one and a half hours away. That's what we call our neighbor here. So traffic. Uh, I, I still struggle. By the way, that what answering this question, <laughs> the I still struggle with um, certain things when I'm doing tutorial. Um, it is something that has to do with the personality of each person that's doing a tutorial. So this is what applies to me. Um, I don't like making tutorials that I don't enjoy using because all for things which don't have a linear um, uh, learning structure. And uh, the reason is there's something about exceptions. When you tell someone this is the general rule, but you have to take care of this, but you have to take care of that. That is something that personally irritates me. So whenever I have to make a tutorial that requires me to give a lot of exceptions, uh, that is something that, uh, you know, it, it, it's very, I don't enjoy doing. How do I overcome it? Well, you just put your head down and you find the best way to show it in the shortest amount of time. And it's a funny thing that this, it gives me a lot of joy personally when I've managed to crack uh, something which doesn't have a linear uh, learning process. But at the end, you manage to compact that knowledge in such a way that even these exceptions become part of the fundamental knowledge. And uh, so it, it's something that irritates me tremendously. It's very hard for me to do, but what comes out at the end usually satisfies me more than just doing a normal tutorial about something that, that works. And uh, this brings me to the first and most, I think, most important thing. Making tutorials has much more to do with the person making it learning the software rather than the person viewing it learning the techniques. And although when someone watches a tutorial, they only take the, the, the latter part of it, for the person making the tutorial, it's a huge advantage uh, that makes them much better at operating the software they're teaching. Uh, I find that 90% of my time when I make a tutorial is everything, including production, editing, 90% of my time is refining the technique. So you have the first stage, which is someone asks a question. Um, or you, you see something that seems quite interesting and you, you start wondering, okay, they do that. Uh, how would we go and solve this problem? How can I improve on a technique? And then I, I do sometimes uh, upwards of 15, 20 times the same scene again and again and again and permutations and tests. And uh, I happen to be very fortunate because I'm very close uh, not only to Maxon as a company, but to a lot of people that work for Maxon or used to work for Maxon, whose uh, knowledge is uh, unbounded on the software. Uh, others are experts, others are generalists. So I, I can, you know, I can dip my toe in, into the pool of knowledge they have. Uh, sometimes to tell me that, no, there is no other method. This is the, the way you do it. Or sometimes you discover that there's something new. So if I know anything about Cinema 4D, most of it 
has come from making tutorials, not from working on projects. Because uh, here's the, the difference. When you are executing a, a project, the final output, which is just the grid of pixels, right? Don't forget, everything you do, and this applies to everyone, everyone that does uh, some sort of uh, visual product, some a movie, anything like that, you're just giving people a file that has colorful pixels, nothing else. That's what you do. You make grids of pixels. So sorry to, to be so, you know, <laughs> it's, you know, the process is difficult, but that's all you do, right? You're selling a series of images or pixels that re represent something. Now, the amount of information you can pack in that is, you know, you can make whole worlds and stories and people's lives and civilizations just by colorizing pixels. But having said that, if you're, if you go pixel by pixel with your uh, pencil in Photoshop, and colorize each pixel and create what the client want, it doesn't make a difference, right? As long as the image you see or the animation you see is the one that's required in, in, within the standards that you, you have to fit it in, uh, you've delivered the product, <clears throat> sorry. But when you're trying to teach a technique, uh, the, the, the story totally changes. Uh, you can use fakes as because a faking something or masking something or hiding something uh, is a technique but you cannot teach or teach people how to use for example MoGraph by manually creating random cubes and moving them around by hand so when you're creating tutorials and uh, taking the fact that you've decided what you're going to show you have to find the best way to show it the orthodox way the tool works any abuse uh, you can apply to the tool to make it perform things slightly different and uh, that is a different way of thinking about the software and what you end up doing is number one you learn a lot of stuff you don't only learn particular tools but whole processes and uh, from from trying to find things you want to make a tutorial to executing them, it, it broadens your understanding of the software and not only the software itself. The research you're going to do to solve a particular problem, because Cinema 4D does not live in a vacuum, it's a, it's a part of a pipeline, right? No one just uses Cinema 4D, uh, other than me lately, but for, for different reasons. But you have to learn um, what does a particular technique or method facilitate and in order to you need to know how the satellite programs work you need to understand compositing better you need to understand nodal systems better whether you're using them for 2d or 3 or whatnot you have to compare it with a competition to see maybe the competition has a certain tool that does something in a particular way can i if that method is better can i find a way to replicate it so you don't only, only broaden your knowledge about Cinema 4D itself, but you actually start broadening your knowledge on the industry, on standards, on formats, even programming. Um, I wouldn't have gotten, although programming was the first thing I ever did with computers when I was 15 years old, um, it, I, it never stuck with me. I, I know I'm a spaghetti coder. Co I know what to copy and paste to make it work, right? Which, which is a talent on itself, but that's a different story. Um, but it, I've, I go into these scripting rabbit holes just because I want to figure out how a component works. Um, the example of that was um, one of the, uh, I believe it's one of the best tools uh, made and given for free is the cache effector. And uh, that was an idea I had, which I worked with uh, my very good friend and um, genius developer, Kevin Barnum, and um, for Cineversity. And it's an effector that stores animations or, or positions. Now, to get to the point to communicate to Gavin what I wanted, I actually created an effector using a Python effector. So, but in order to do that, I had to find out how MoGraph works internally. There's a series of arrays that store certain data and so forth. Although I did something that had nothing to do with an applic uh, applicable sort of um, there was nothing I could do with what I made. It allowed me to learn so much more about the core of MoGraph that gave me 
enough information to understand the surface tools, the fields and um, the cloners and the effectors and all that. So sometimes you go on these really seemingly unrelated rabbit holes and you end up gaining so much information and sometimes the information is a lot and you only pick up one or two specific, specific things about it which allow you you get those aha moments like oh now i get it now that's why this works like this it works like that so this uh, sort of <laughs> rambling it, it for me, the biggest advantage you're going to get uh, by starting to make tutorials and try to make them as good as possible is you are going to learn an enormous amount of, of uh, things about the software you're teaching. So that's the, the thing. And that ties in with Nick's question that, you know, the, the worst thing for me gives me the best result. It, it, it gives me those aha moments and those you know the, the the fact that I I broke it now I can teach it for me that's it when I can teach it that means I understand it in such a way that I can tell anyone how it works and that's what gives me um, that's what satisfies me so it's it's a hard path uh, to to go down but uh, the um, the gains are enormous I, I do mostly this for for good karma by the way the you know, getting paid for it is a sort of a, a side it's a bonus, isn't it? Yeah. It's, <laughs> it's often been said that um, you only really learn something by teaching it. And um, the, it, that's an interesting concept. As Jonathan's been saying, we are just pixels. So it sounds like Mike TV in Charlie and Chocolate Factory to some extent. <laughs> Absolutely. And there's a side question from Garrett is asking about the, the types of tutorials, where, which ones you prefer, whether it's objective-based. I think you've talked about this already, but um, the objective-based where you get a finite thing or whether more of an abstract one with less of a concrete goal. But, but I've got a side question because the, sometimes we have to get something out quickly and it's, um, we don't necessarily have the luxury of going through the the topic multiple times or I'm, I'm guilty of this in the past learning something and then presenting it as if i've known it for a long time in fact that's training by the way everyone so um what would you say if, if you what would be a good technique if you've got to get something out quickly and you haven't have you have, don't have the luxury of spending a longer amount of time uh, researching it or if should that not be done should we always just kind of reserve it for things that we know well yeah, that's a that's a very interesting thing i don't think education uh for you know in any form whether it's a tutorial for software whether it's academia uh time constraints they shouldn't exist that that is a an unfortunate uh i would say result of the way generally things are done everything is hasty everything needs to be on a schedule and so forth because what's the point of uh when it comes to learning when it comes to knowledge what's the point of cutting the essence of knowledge, knowledge, which is the knowledge itself, in order to gain something else, like time. No, it, you, you have to put in as much time as necessary. Now, again, having said that, um, we know we don't live in that uh, uh, utopia. We, we live in a real world where we're all going to die, by the way, you know, and uh, others sooner than others. So you, we need to, to take into consideration all the constraints uh you know there, there's a when you do a tutorial and you're getting paid for it it has to represent something you you put in the tutorial and all that so the world works in that way what i would say the best the best method uh to do the best job with the given constraints which is what applies to everything that's produced unless the government pays for it is identify your viewer that that's the number one thing your target group is what's the most important thing about a tutorial. You can make the most amazing tutorial where no one cares about, right? Then it, it doesn't make any sense to, to me. Everyone's going to watch it and the people are going to watch it. They're going to be like, okay, nice tutorial. Just wasted 10 minutes of my time. So if you identify as precisely as possible the type of viewer you want to see, and when I say a type of viewer, knowledge level is one thing. It's a very important thing. Uh, but also uh, the, the style, I've, I've taken some notes about that. Um, what the, the, the way they like to consume tutorials. There's some people that like those quick GIFs. They know enough of the software to figure out what's going on, how they're going to do things. Uh, other people want a more 
uh, detailed approach to things. But in order to define how quickly you can present a particular uh, knowledge group or certain topics, you have to know what your viewer is, what they know, what you think they know, the style in which they learn. I've heard people watching tutorials at 1.5 speed on uh, videos, and I've, uh, I know of people that watch a tutorial, pause, try something, so they, they're going in slow motion. You, you won't, you should make the same tutorial for both. Now, the, the wider the scope of a tutorial, the better the chances of that tutorial to be more widely consumed. And that is the ideal situation. Sometimes we call it the shelf life. Uh, as long as people are watching a tutorial, uh, that means it's uh, quite successful. Um, so th th there's no real answer to this. It all depends on what are the people you're addressing. What is their, their mental state? Uh, are they uh, people that consume information faster? Uh, there's a group of people that like to read headlines and don't care about the essence. Uh, and there's other people that want to go in the weeds. And we can see in reality, we can see both styles. Um, I reference Andrew Kramer uh, as one of the best tutorial makers out there. I personally enjoy all his work, whether I care about what he's showing or not. Um, yeah, but Andrew, anyway. Oh yeah, exactly. So you're, you're watching, you know, some some sort of uh, series on a, on a television. It's always fun to watch. Anyway, and the the result is always impressive. It's always good looking. Uh, but his tutorials are long form. So we can we can set any number of rules, like a tutorial needs to be seven to nine minutes and this and that. Yeah, but Andrew Kramer has made some of the most successful tutorials and he goes on and on and on and on and he shows things and at the end, it's amazing. So there, again, there is no rule. Um, this is, so something which I've talked about with Sassy as well, you know, making tutorials is, sort of an art form in itself. Um, and you can compare it to creating a movie. And movies have, you can make a short movie, anything from a few seconds to many, many hours, and then uh, sequels, or you know, you can extend a movie into years of uh, content. Uh, at the end of the day, a movie conveys emotion. That's the, the, the number one thing, emotion. Whereas a tutorial, is an art form that conveys information. If you can dress it up, just like a movie uses information to manipulate the emotional state of uh, the viewer, uh, you can do the opposite using a tutorial. You can use the, uh, the emotion to manipulate the way the information is conveyed. So you can go really deep into the whole tutorial making. What I would like to see is, I would like to see people coming up with different tutorial concepts the way they 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 write their tutorial stories because um uh, you know th th still the majority of people think number one that making tutorials is easy everyone that has tries ha tried has failed and i it always puts a smile on my face um the and the other thing is um lost my channel thought happens that's why you know i can record again when this happens to me so <laughs> Uh, a lot of people think it's um, a very simple process. And uh, the, the other thing is that people don't understand that it's not just telling people, it's not a manual, right? A tutorial is not the manual. You can open the manual and start calling out the names of the tools and reading out the manual or changing the words. That won't make it a tutorial. Um, a tutorial is predominantly how you set up your user, how you prepare their minds as they're watching it to be more susceptible to the information that comes through. That's why one of the rules is create positive anticipation. Don't make something, start making something without anyone knowing what the end goal for that particular segment is. Because that type of knowledge does not get absorbed. It doesn't, it, the brain doesn't know where to put it. You have to memorize it. Whereas when you know what the end goal of that series of actions is going to be, the brain classifies each piece of information where it needs to go. So I think it's very important to start um, addressing tutorials as a very particular, I would say, art 
form, I would say art form, because it does manipulate emotions um, and prepares the human brain to accept some things, but it has to start being accepted as some sort of uh, obscure, some sort of a very contemporary uh, art form, because the video tutorial is fairly new in our uh, civilizations, right? Most most teaching comes from people and practice and you know and books and stuff like that. This consumption of uh, videos, uh, which is now becoming, especially during the the COVID times, um, has grown exponentially. Uh, needs to start being refined. We need new people getting in the field to create the new generation of tutorials that people will enjoy watching. There will be as short as possible and will teach as much as possible it's so that's the cost for everyone. I, I would i would agree the, the the takeaway i'm sensing is that um in training club the first rule of training club is there are no rules that, apart from all the rules so it, it is very much um, your own your own takeaway and your own personality that comes across and you're absolutely spot on with the, here's me telling you that you're right, but um, you're absolutely spot on with the multiple durations that apply and work for different people at different different lengths and different styles. Um, and the, <laughs> at the risk of um, self-promotion, we like the 20 second tips that we've been doing over the last year. That in fact, recently Nick has been posting, I think it's three a week on those things. And we still get comments back like I got one a couple of days ago that's from something I recorded a year ago that said, I've learned more in this 20 seconds than I have from all the other tutorials on the topic. So there's, in some cases, it is definitely a case of the a memory jogger, if you like. But in some other cases, you definitely want that personal feeling. Something you said right at the top, which was take the tool, use it in its correct way, and then show how you can use it incorrectly to actually then get extra features or something that's very popular with uh, with design departments make something look like it people haven't seen before and we hear that a lot uh, we go into broadcasters and they're quite keen for training not necessarily just so they know the software better but because they can expand their designs and it means that they they end up with new content and it looks differently so it's 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 an interesting thing about i think i, I would say if i was paraphrasing it's it's a question of researching the format, seeing how people learn, but then also referencing your own style and then seeing how that engages with the audience. And I, as I would also say, doing different tests to see what works and what doesn't. Yep, and don't forget that stories can be told from a single um, a strip from a newspaper, black and white. You can tell a whole story in one clip with just one person making one phrase to a 15 hour series of movies with special effects, with sound, with uh, anything, and both the mediums and everything in between uh, portrays, you know, an interesting story nonetheless. And the same, I think, applies to uh, tutorial making. You can go from a 10 second GIF or GIF uh, and expand it into a, <laughs> and expand it into a multi series in depth look there the i think it's unbounded and i do invite people to start experimenting with uh, these things and see how they are accepted what i wouldn't like what i don't like and this is <clears throat> one of the things i mean we we can only we can only ac accept what what people do right um there are many tutorials some of them extremely successful that literally show the wrong way of doing something or they omit it's not the right or wrong they omit the the most uh, flexible way so i'm not going to say any examples and all that the tutorials are not they they, they don't lie to you they, 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 it's not that they said do this and it can't happen but th there are certain tools certain things um, and maybe the tutorial maker didn't know them it's good for people to do some research when they're doing something a bit more than what they currently know. So this yeah. ties into my, my first point. You feel ready to do a tutorial. Spend a couple of hours to see if there are alternative methods to what you're trying to do, which offer um, at the same time or faster to create a setup which has other advantages. If you find that 
there are different methods that have two different advantages and disadvantages. Now you have two tutorials. So, uh, you know, don't always believe that what you currently know about something is, you know, the, the, the full range of what can be known about that thing. I'm not saying don't do the tutorial, go ahead and make a tutorial, you know, about anything the way you want it. Uh, that, I, I don't like to put, uh, you know, to set rules, do whatever you want, but it's good, number one for yourself and for your viewers uh, to get the best possible information and knowledge out of a tutorial or two yeah. or three. John's so got that's... an interesting side comment on this um, <laughs> about this very subject and he asks, in fact, he knows how to ask you a question. So this is great. The um, In academia, as well as online tutorials, Sean says, it seems there's a divide of becoming or being an expert with a very traditional dry delivery versus being an entertaining educator. So he's just asking what your view is on this. And then he finishes up with, because you're obviously very an expert and very entertaining, Manassas. So yeah, that's first exactly of all, I'm way to ask the questions. I'm a high school graduate, okay? That's my academic uh, achievement. Um, and, you know, the stuff I wanted to study in the country I wanted to study them, at the time I was at that age, it wasn't really possible. And various other things. So my relationship with academia is a, a love-hate relationship. Um, the, the problem I have, which I don't have a solution for, by the way, so if I don't have a solution, that means that it's a problem, but it's a problem that's not created by the non-application of solutions, right? It's a difficult problem to solve, is that once you are accepted uh, as an expert, expert, right? You got your PhDs and all that, and I'm going to tell you a story about PhDs. Um, no one outside of that circle really has the right to challenge you right you get you know arguments from authority and this and that so it it does you know being an expert on something is not always sorry my son just came in Ari in half an hour thank you so, yeah. it, homeschooling you know being yeah, a human said, is also <laughs> part of being tutorials yes human? where are the humans right <laughs> so um, once you I could, the problem with academia is that it's very hard for uh, to assess someone outside the academic standards, all right? It, 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 and that's, it is a problem. We need to establish different mechanisms in order to assess something, but then you're not an academic institution, you become something else. So the problem is very hard to solve. I'd love to talk to academics to maybe conceptualize on various uh, solutions. Now, being an entertaining educator, that's just a style, right? If you don't know what you're talking about, I can, I believe I can deliver a nice 30 minute lecture without conveying any significant information whatsoever. You know, uh, you don't need, there is, my, what I would say is that there's a different talent to be able to entertain people. Um, comedians, for example, well, they can say things which are all false. There will be some knowledge that goes through, uh, maybe a joke or two, they're going to be very entertaining, uh, but they haven't conveyed any any knowledge. The question becomes, should we qualify uh, people that provide education, not only based on their knowledge, but based on the ability to teach? Which, by the way, is a segue, an early segue to something we've tried to include in our certifications, right? We're going to talk about it a bit later. Uh, but it is a problem. The biggest problem, <clears throat> I would say, has to do with, um, how can I put it uh, politely? There, there's an ego to be, uh, that, that exists with uneducated, highly trained individuals like myself <clears throat> and highly educated, let's say, not fully knowledgeable uh, people on the other side. One of the curses of academia is that one of its best, now, one of its curses is one of its best things. When when you get tenure, uh, unless you personally want to, you know, uh, move forward and evolve in, in you know, in, in your profession, in, in your expertise, the system itself does very little uh, to push you to do that. So, in, in fast-moving industries like, uh, 
what we do, uh, DCC applications, uh, 3D, visual medium and all that, where things change in lightning speed. Just yesterday, Unreal Engine 5 came out and I'm blown away, you know. I, I go to, to, to Epic's uh, website and download it and, and all that. It's a new paradigm shift. If I were an academic and I was teaching 3D, I don't think I'll have enough, even if I worked 24 hours a day uh, with coffee and all sorts of drugs, I wouldn't be able to keep up with everything that's happening. So th this is not just a limitation of someone saying, ah, I'm a tenured professor now, I don't care. It is a problem of the industry, but at the same time, it's very difficult for people to lose track. Um, when you are, professors are, you know, a professor is a very busy person, right? They have their lectures, they have their, you know, they, they have to manage their TAs, they, they have to live within a system that forces them to, to have meetings and do this and do that. It's not like, you know, we're just sitting there, a professor just sitting there and doing nothing. So <clears throat> how does someone keep the, the balance of these two things. So I think I'm just complicating uh, an already complicated uh, thing here. I just believe there needs to be some sort of balance. Academic institutions need to start embracing the fact that for many uh, disciplines, especially that have to do with commercial products, uh, that the speed these things evolve at is impossible for any academic that works in the university to keep up with. They have to accept that. They have to surrender, raise their hands, and then approach companies like Maxon, companies like, I can't say their name, other companies. You know, uh, they have to approach the companies that develop Other companies software. are available. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, rumor has it, rumor has it that uh, Maxon is not the only one. But um, universities need to do that. At the same time, Maxon needs to start pushing more aggressively, not to be not to teach Maxon products in universities. No, no. Uh, companies like Maxon need to find ways to make it easier for experts to keep their knowledge. Because if you cannot entice the professor of a particular institution to show the latest technologies and the latest advancement advancements, you know, what's we, the, the students are going to lose so much time learning things which are out of date and those students are going to be, become your potential clients. So it needs, it's a bridge that needs to be built, for, uh, built from both sides and uh, meet somewhere uh, in the middle. Um, I mean, I'm aware of an institution where the guidance a couple of years ago was always use TGA images for all your texturing. And that was, uh, I think that was uh, the proper thing to say 20 years ago all right and that saddens me that saddens me because it shows that if if something as simple as uh, image file formats has stayed back 20 25 years what chance is there for more advanced concepts uh, to be understood and taught uh, in a university setting yes yeah, it's, a, it's so, a changing thing constantly and that that that's the whole point that you were saying about earlier on keeping keeping relevant and keeping the studying as you're then preparing for them i've got a couple of questions as as an extra i'll let you finish your thought on this Vanessa. but we've got a couple of questions also about the process of it well um my my you know i think that we need to agree that universities and experts in universities don't know as much as they think they know, right? And please, Simon, find a polite way to say that. I don't like to say it. Properly, but you know me. You know me. I can't say things differently than what my brain tells me. It's not my fault. It's my brain's fault. Um, and companies like Maxon need to find ways to make it enticing for someone that doesn't need to do that, right? No one's going to lose their job, you know. And and that's a hard reality. If I were a tenured professor, you know, I would have a different outlook on what I need to do and how much time I need to spend. I do know professors that <clears throat> spend the majority of their time trying to learn new things, but overall humans are humans. You know, we're, we're talking about um, the, the, the way humans see the world. So the, I think it's, it's imperative that companies that create software need to make the best efforts to um, offer as much help as possible to people and uh, that institutions need to do as much as possible 
to admit, to make the, the professors admit that, yeah, the majority are not up to speed with the latest uh, technologies and find ways to, to bridge that gap. That's my overall understanding. I mean, that's there. There is a segue here for something, something we're going to jump into very shortly, which is the certification and also the Cineversity topic. And we'll, we'll talk about that. There's a, there's an option for if you want to become a tutorial maker for Cineversity. That was the other thing we were going to say. That um, please, please get in contact. And with even if you are not a seasoned tutorial maker, we have <laughs> we have the people who can help you with that. Okay, I have so, to say um, something very important about that. Yeah, absolutely. Please we're going to, so we're going to say, say something. Can I throw in a couple of questions before we leap mm -hmm. over on that topic? It was just a couple of practical ones. Um, Sharon had a question, which then mm -hmm. reminded me of something that I really wanted to find out. In fact, not just from you, Thanasis, but also from the rest of the panel here. So tell you what, I'll start with that one, and then I'll ask, I'll ask your question to Sharon about re-recording and going back and um, having a look at it after time. But um, the, the thing that has always concerned me or entertained my time over the years making tutorials is whether to do it um, from notes and bullet points or whether to do it from a pre-recorded script, read that out, make it sound like I'm not reading, and then perform the tutorial after the event, uh, as well as going back and editing. And there are some superhumans that I have witnessed who can just do this from scratch, not say um every other word, and be able to then eloquently explain the concept and do it in an absolutely wonderful fashion, which most likely is because they've been uh, doing this for a very long time and they know the subject really well. But I was just interested um, from the rest of the panel, if I could just put you on the spot, uh, how do you, what's your go-to method? Tell you what, Ellie, can I throw you, throw you in first? <laughs> what, how do you approach that sort of thing when you're recording a tutorial? Is there is there um, a specific thing that you find more useful than something else? Um, so I have done ones where I've had like a script, but I always find it just sounds too too prepared and I know obviously we want to be prepared when we're doing a tutorial so we like say the right things and stuff like that but yeah I it came across a bit too rigid so I like to have almost like just some notes having gone through like I like for me if I'm doing a tutorial I run through it about five or six times and so I know what I'm doing I I, I say out loud luckily no one's here in the day to hear me just kind of going on and then I'm kind of rehearsed in it. And so I've got my notes when it comes to recording, but I, I've already practiced like multiple times what I'm gonna do and say. And yeah, I found that worked um, because then it comes across natural, but then you're not stuck for what to say because you have practiced a couple yeah. times. <laughs> Absolutely, that's very useful advice. Um, Nick, what, how do you use, how do you approach these things? Uh, I've kind of gone through a few generations uh, with recording some stuff from LinkedIn, but uh, for one company that I worked for, I had the ability to have a teleprompter, so it would always be an on-screen introduction, and I would have that part scripted, the introduction. But then when I hopped into the software to show the actual technique, it was fully ad-libbed. Uh, I find myself with a lot of screen recordings today that I would go back if something wasn't phrased correctly and then do a pickup uh, in sections of a screen record rather than um, re-record it that day uh, for a few reasons of, of energy depending on how long that video is. But today I find myself doing a, a big hybrid between scripted and ad-libbed for uh, content created, like all the 20 second tips are fully scripted. And um, I have a, a show that I just put together where 70% of it's fully scripted, 30% of it is short ad-libbed tips. It's interesting. I've also had a situation where I've changed techniques and maybe it's according to the actual delivery method as well. The, the 20 second tips remind me about that apology. Sorry for the long letter. I didn't have time to send you a short one. <laughs> Because there's, you have to be really on the money to be able to do those words in 20 seconds without scripting it. And, and actually, you. Oh, sorry, go on. I was going to say, because you started, uh, Simon started the 20 second tips like a few years back. And uh, one thing that I learned from you was how uh, important it was to fit things into a certain word count, which I've never had to, to do before. 
as in if you recite a certain amount of information too quickly, it was uh, almost the flow of it didn't come across as natural as it could versus if you kept, if I'm correct, the word count between the magical 40 or 50 words, then uh, it seemed to flow correctly as well as cut uh, correctly with the actual video images that are being shown in those tips. Absolutely. Three three words a second is the famous duration, um, less the amount for pausing and breaths, and also to give everyone a beat to actually take in the information without just finishing, like an advert, the 30 second ad that fits in too much, suddenly it's over and you think, what was that? So there's, there's got to be time to actually consume that. But this fits into Sharon's question about looking at something again and do you then re-record something if you're not happy or um, occasionally, uh, we can, if we have the luxury of having an external editor, um, then we can ask them to have a look at it. And it's always interesting seeing seeing it back after it's been edited, if you haven't edited it yourself, which I, I, I find is fascinating. But Dr. Sassi, um, what would, what's your takeaway? What's, how do you approach this? Uh, I think I have done every way possible in the last 15 years. <laughs> And of course, uh, failures a lot, and and you you try things out if you want to push things further. You 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 will fail if you don't fail. You don't have tried hard enough to say it in that way. Um, in the early days, there were no real reference how to do it, so we had to explore it. And I had the luxury to be in a group, Pixel Corp, where I had a following of 300 people on a daily basis who gave me instant feedback to every tutorial. And that enabled me to have my audience in my brain when I recorded, so I was talking to them, which is a huge help. And that would be a tip to everyone. Create a user group wherever you are, get 10 people together, meet once a week and discuss something so you feel it is engaging, inspiring, motivational, and it is educational on the end. And from my point of view, I love my tutorials best, if I may say so, <laughs> that I have recorded over 20 times. When I oh, made really? a mistake, especially with my rusty English back in the times, I stumbled over words, or I said, oh God, what was that word, and so on. And I don't like to edit because the flow goes away, the energy goes away. And when you re-record all the time, you let pieces out that are not so important because you don't want to say it again and you make the same joke again and so on. And after 20 times, you have a fluidity in it. You are fluent in what you want to say and you are clear that it works. And when you go step by step, you have already forgotten. Maybe you cut something out that was essential or you, you hear sometimes tutorials where people cut these things and they say it twice, which is really annoying. But when you go one time through, you pressure through it and yes, it takes then three hours to record five minutes. You're exhausted after that, but you feel the energy and that's important. And again, I want to stress it. You have to have an audience in your brain that you want to educate, you want to see them smile, you want to see that they get the idea. It's not you that presents and makes, makes yourself important or something like that. It is that you give to people something so they can do their art in the best way. And that's the feeling, that's the spirit that you want to get across. Anything else is not so, so relevant from my point of view. That's a really interesting point about the audience and also the performance factor and then they're having the same energy for multiple takes. The, um, the, the greatest piece of advice I got for this was inadvertently, because I happened a few years ago to see the same Broadway show, Two Nights Running. I think Kate Blanchett was um, doing the main performance in it. And then she did, on the first night, she did this amazing improv thing, I thought that's incredible. And then the second night, um, it was an accident, by the way, I didn't design to go to this Two Nights Running, but. Um, as different friends wanted to see different things. But the second night, she did exactly the same thing. And it again looked improvisational. And I thought, okay, that, that makes it okay. If if somebody of her caliber is able to do this and repeat it and make it sound off the cuff and so on, then I can do the same joke forever. So, and, that, and that's why I do it. But the, uh, that, that process about having an audience then assists, that's, um, and uh, then also they, um, the process of how you perform is in is interesting i mean how do you do it do you do you script it do you do it from bullet points do you re-record and re-edit 
um, I'm going to decline to reply because it's all in the video. I have a very strict. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, I don't have to say the same things. We'll just go watch the video and tell friends to watch them as well. Um, overall, yeah, I've uh, settled in a very spe uh, specific uh, process, and it's come from advice from many people. And uh, shout out to Matthew O'Neill, uh, the infamous Mash 3D Fluff, uh, one of the best tutorial makers out there. And uh, yeah, he just uh, gave me a few tips once that changed my life and in in improved my productivity about the uh, the milestone. So um, just go check out the video, and I I give a full. I've even I even have a checklist for you to download and go through all the things you need to do. But I do want to ask for something. Please don't contact me and ask me. I want you to review my tutorial, right? And there's a reason for that. Uh, it's part of what I do as my job for Max on, on Cineversity. Uh, watch people's tutorials and review them. Even if you're watching the best tutorial on in the world, uh, it does become very daunting because there are no shortcuts. You have to watch it from the beginning to the end and pay attention. Unless you want me to lie to you, and I'll just immediately reply, it's amazing. But I haven't sent you the link. No, it's amazing. So please don't ask me to review uh, tutorials, right? Um, Follow your 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 gut feeling. Follow you know the the guidance I'll give you, and then do whatever else you want. Your viewers are the ones which are going to give you the the best feedback. So please don't send me tutorial links. Right? Send me the links so I can watch them at my own leisure. Don't ask me for for feedback. Um, it's a very uh, daunting task to have to pay attention. Not only learn. When you watch a, a tutorial and you want to learn, it's easy, it's fun. Uh, imagine if your job is to watch a movie, a uh, two-hour movie, again and again and again to fix, to find any mistakes. If there are any problems with the uh, visual effects, if there's any problem with the sound, it becomes a totally different experience. I don't enjoy that. So thank you for your understanding. I will just ignore any uh, requests. So yeah, that's all I have to say for now. <laughs> And that's a good point. And we got on the screen here the link or the, the website, which is YouTube, of course, to the Maxon training team. And if you go there, you'll see the playlist of how to make tutorials. This is what Thanasis is talking about. And that has got in it a whole series of tutorials with all those exact things that I just asked him that he didn't answer me. So go go there and find those out. Because that this is these are the sorts of things if I if I wanted to say this that I wish I'd known years ago when I was starting out doing this. So right down to the pragmatic sound and how you're coming across from all from an audio standpoint, not just visually. So I think that it's an essential must listen. Yes, as make sure you've got as much off screen noise as possible. And the, I've been muting my mic because somebody's been cutting the grass right outside my window all sessions. I was thinking that, that would be a good demonstration of exactly how not to do one of these. <laughs> but the, thank you also, by the way, for the kind comments that have been coming in and about uh, the this this session and some of the other sessions and about your experience also with learning and teaching too. So that's that's lovely to lovely to see those. And the and <laughs> this is a great segue, isn't it? Talking about teaching and learning. <laughs> We one other topic we wanted to just talk about and share is this concept of becoming certified, and uh, we we have um, at Maxon we've got a certification program, and uh, Thanasis has been one of the key the keystones or the capstones in this whole program, and uh, we, there's a whole philosophy philosophy rather behind this. Um, and pragmatic approach. So we just wanted to talk about that shortly. The spoiler alert, we may slightly overrun on time, but it's us. If you've been to any of our other sessions, you, you knew this before we started. But um, I just wanted to, uh, to open up and ask you about the certification program, Thanasis. Yeah, so first of all, what problem does it solve? Um, the current certification process solved a when I moved to, to Canada and started working with the uh, with uh, Paul's administration, uh, Max in US, um, I started, you know, and the uh, United States, I think, had a big pie in, in the uh, motion graphics, uh, maybe the biggest of, of the rest of the world. And there was one problem I was made aware, uh, which is that companies cannot 
don't have a particular way of finding people that are good enough in Cinema 4D so that they can sit at a computer and start working. They, they could be great artists, but their technical abilities were not tested. And then you had a lot of students with enormous student debts that couldn't get jobs, although they were very good artists and very competent at uh, their, their discipline. And it was the two sides and there was nothing in between. It was just a, a, a brute force method where people would send their CVs, they would try and see if the portfolio is good, that's a different story, you know, um, maybe an internship or you know, come and work for a week uh, or sit down, give us a test. It's, it's not an easy thing uh, to assess. So the idea that was sort of what was seeded at that point when I was uh, originally discussing this with Paul was, can we create a method by which a certain type of certification, a test, a, a time-limited test, will, uh, will be able to sort of certify if someone has the, the limited, the lowest necessary knowledge so that they can be useful in a production setting, right? We're not talking about someone that will just sit there and do anything that's required but a person that can sit and let me put it this way be worth a salary that's it and because it's again it's a very difficult thing and 3d is a very complex thing so um i started interviewing various people uh, some of them knew they were being interviewed some of them didn't i started collecting information uh from uh, peers colleagues uh, people that own studios and so forth i did some test training sessions to see to assess what is that necessary path someone needs to go anyhow fast forward a year ago and now we have what's called the topic list uh, a link will be provided somewhere in, in go to webinar and that link is a pdf currently that has a list of topics uh, by which we believe uh, and it may be slightly changed in the future are the minimum amount of things someone needs to know uh, in order to be able to solve everyday problems in Cinema 4D. And even if there's something above their, their current knowledge, it's enough, it provides, knowing these things provides enough background, enough uh, baseline uh, knowledge that learning a new technique or, new, uh, or learning a new tool or expanding a bit more and becoming an expert or something uh, is something that can come within a few hours or a few days, watching a few tutorials, asking a few questions, referring to the manual and so forth. So this fun the topic list is the basis for what we call the uh, certified, oh, I forget the, the whole name. It's the basic comprehensive uh, certification Cinema 4 Basics Comprehensive Certification. It just trips off the tongue, doesn't it? There you go. So, and uh, basically the test itself um, is a, it can be up to four hours. It's uh, conducted currently online, face-to-face -face with a certified trainer or a master trainer. And the process is a series of tasks and questions uh, that the trainer will ask while the um, the the uh, candidate is sharing their screen uh, there's a folder full of exercise files and uh, they'll be instructed to go to this folder do this and i do have three examples of what i mean so i may might as well share my screen to show you a very small very small part of what the test is now these may or may not be part of uh, the test so show my main screen. I hope main screen is just sent well. over the button to you. They should have a button Excellent. there somewhere. Got it. So everyone should be seeing my screen now. Is not that quite, not quite yet? It's appeared on that showing main screen thing. I think there's there's another show now button perhaps. I could I could send you the link again. Or send no. You the again. I, no, no, I can see a screen. Yeah, can you? Simon, it's you. It's you. It's, it's me. never yeah. me. Yeah, it's never me. <laughs> Me too. Okay. All right. Okay. I'll trust you. So, Simon, there's a button there that says, look at Thanasis' screen, right? Oh, so. there. There it is. <laughs> so, let me go to that page where I'm telling myself what I need to do. There you go. I've got three monitors and 
100 million windows here. So you can see this mesh, all right? So the instructor, uh, amongst a, a huge number of questions, would say, please open the from folder blah, 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 open bust model to be fixed, 01A. So you open this, and uh, we ask the following question. Can you please stitch the part of the neck that's missing without moving either the top or the bottom part? So what you would need to do is, let's say, turn off your subdivision surface to see the topology, select this, go to your edge selection, uh, go and create a loop selection, shift click, uh, find a common point, right click, do a stitch and sew, so stitch and sew, uh, press shift and do that, right? Now, the next, great. So this part of the question has been answered and the key um, the key method behind the, the type of testing is that I didn't just test you on the stitch tool, I tested you on the understanding of generators that you need to turn them off. I could have had this set without lines and you would have to go and turn on your lines, which means you have a basic understanding of uh, how the display modes work. Uh, you need to know that in order to um, access the components, you need to switch to another mode here. Um, I would ask you then, so already in my checklist of things you know, uh, you getting to this point within 15 seconds, you have already proved that you know quite a few things about modeling. Then I would say, can you please subdivide the part of the neck with a long polygon? So you do something like, you can do an edge cut. I don't, I personally don't mind someone using a different method. I may ask for a different method. So KL, do this, add subdivisions, good, done, or select using UB, or just go to the selection and select this and do an edge cut like this, turn off your, your N-Gons, none, and add one, two, three, apply, see how many. So there are many ways to do this, and your your trainer may request you to do it in, in both ways, but either way shows that you know enough about polygon modeling to get away with it. Then I would say something like, uh, would you mind smoothing only the new polygons? So you can convert your selection or go and say, okay, I'm gonna select this and this and fill selection, shift, add that. And can you smooth them, smooth them using your smooth sculpt brush and flood? Now, this is guiding the, the candidate towards a solution, right? Go to mesh, brushes, bring them up, get the smooth, go to flood, right? But if you don't know about the brushes, regardless of how much guidance the trainer gives you, you won't be able to do it. So suddenly, this executing this to this point has shown me that you have a, a fair understanding of all the sculpt brushes. I don't care if you know exactly what the scrape does. I don't care if you know exactly what the fall off and the stamp do. You know enough of the tool so that if someone asks you to go and do some uh, stencil uh, sculpting and so forth, you can learn it in the next 15 minutes. You know enough of sculpting so that watching a tutorial or two will allow you to find the solution. And that's because if we were going to test Cinema 4D in its totality, we'd be taking a multi-month test. It will be, you will have to invest a lot of your time. So for example, this is now considered solved. I got all the points and this guy has a very long neck. Thank you very much. Another question would be, okay, go to 22 MoGraph and open um, buildings by height. So you go here, buildings by height. Now, some of these exercises are, most of them are open book exercises. The final solution is uh, not this one, that's another one, buildings by height, final, okay? This is the final solution. I want a quasi-random placement of buildings where the tallest ones are at the back, the shortest ones are at the, uh, the front. Uh, there's a bit of randomization. There's a, a quantized rotation by 90 degrees on some of these, and some of these are missing, they're hidden. So in order to take this and start, um, there we go, buildings by height. So you, I would tell people, so I've arranged them so the tallest one is one and the shortest one is nine and everything in between. Let's begin by use a plane effector and a field to sort the buildings by height with the taller buildings at the back of the grid. So number one, you need to sort them. 
Number two, you need to use a plane effector. You need to turn this off, activate modify clone, go here, add a linear field, switch the linear field to uh, be back, oh, wrong, the other way around. There you go, fine, and extend it so it's big enough to encapsulate them all. So task one has been achieved, turn off the color, thank you very much, we don't need that color. Now the second question would be, can you please add some randomization to the buildings? Not much, just a bit of randomization to the sorting of the buildings. So there are certain things you can do. You can add a random field over here and uh, bring down uh, the value. Um, you can multiply this if you want. Anyway, any indication that you understand the randomization process uh, gives me as the, the certified trainer um, a good idea that you know what you're doing. You can go, you can add another plane effector and uh, do it that way. It doesn't really matter because both solutions will facilitate the the final objective if that's what you need to do in your studio for a particular project okay so yeah that person knows fields and they understand the general concept so let's continue can you randomize their rotations uh, quantized by 90 degrees so select this go and add a plane effector uh, go to the plane effector make this a 360 and uh, then go to the fall off, add a random effector, and go to the remapping and quantize it here. So quantization, and what is it? It's four, I think. There you go, 90 degrees. So these are the kinds of uh, things you would do for MoGraph, and then you would say, okay, I want you to delete some of these clones manually, right? Just select some and delete them. You'd go and create a MoGraph selection for this. You know, you, you, well, you'll have to see the little uh, dot somewhere. In order to select the dots, uh, you just have to click and the dots will be uh, a bit more visible. There they are. So I want to select these and these and these. And uh, yeah, you would go and say, okay, I want to go and uh, remove these and turn this off and put it visibility. And maybe I need to increase. No, I'm actually going to take, I'm not going to do that. That's a mistake. It won't work that way you actually have to use it in the field context. So go to field, and each one of these questions has um, some sort of time limit. So again, this is one of the ways you can go about uh, doing that. And now all you have to do is go and select uh, any ones you need to, to make vanish. So uh, for this whole MoGraph thing, you would say you have uh, 10 minutes to execute all these tasks, which is ample time if you know what you're doing. Um, if someone doesn't know something, uh, they may lose some points, so to speak, from a particular topic. And uh, the instructor at the end of the test will provide them with the topics that they feel were not met. And uh, the scoring, which you would read, you can read in the uh, appropriate documentation, to pass it, to become a certified user, you actually need to score more than 90%, right? Because this is the minimum amount of knowledge you need to have. We, we you know, the 75% of the minimum amount knowledge is, amount of knowledge is not enough. It's not an easy test, uh, but you know, if uh, you want to have some sort of guarantee, uh, then you need to know stuff you need to, to work on your, your knowledge. Now, there's a question that comes up, how do I know I'm ready to be part of the test? Let me show another couple of exercises, we'll get to that uh, in a moment. So another one would be, take this wiggly te text and use all these components to create the final version. So press play, this wiggles. Uh, what someone would do is go and activate everything, see what's going on here, check the um, parameters. The sides are two. This is the length. Uh, we've moved it slightly. So it's an open book test because you can actually go and see what's going on. You check out the topologies to make sure that everything is going well. If you don't know how a formula field works, if you don't know what a spline wrap works, if you don't know the modes of a spline subdivided to get subdivisions on the curved and the other segments and all that, you won't be able to solve it regardless of how many times you look into the file. So we're not trying to, these are not trick questions. We're not trying to catch someone that, uh, you know, they, they lost their train of thought. We're giving them the solution, but you will not be able to put this together unless you know how all these things work. So we want people to just prove they know what they do they're doing. So why is this black shadow? I was going to ask. Why is this black shadow? All right, in the questions, uh, the first one that replies, uh, I don't know, give them a t-shirt. 
why do we have these black lines here? What are these? No one? Nobody? Anyone from the trainers here? Anyone? Everyone knows. Sassy knows. Nick, do you know? All right, Nick, what are these black lines? You look confused. All right. It's the oh, phone. talking to me. <laughs> yeah, there's no other Nick. It's the phone tag. So that's a very a common artifact that comes up. Uh, and again, it's a, this is as far as a trick question would be. Uh, you do need to have experienced this in order to see it. But there may be, these questions are to catch those people that want to ace the, te the, the test. So uh, let me show a last one. Um, which one was that? Axes. So, by the, by the way, so that's just the whole bunch of people jumping in with Fong. <laughs> so, Excellent. So, so thanks, Glenn, Ken, Marco, Greg, TJ, so, and, and Keith Ray. So you're, you're, uh, you're, on, you're on the road for certification, obviously. Yeah. Uh, Simon, I promised them you have to send them T-shirts now. Well, we can do that. Good. <laughs> Especially if I ask in public, what is Simon going to say? No, Thanasis, I can't do that. <laughs> but that's what I love to do. So uh, this is an interesting one. Rotate me first. You rotate this. Great. Rotate me second. Ooh, why is it stretchy? And here, this is another typical thing. If you did any scaling using the object mode, uh, this one here has a scale of two that's the null has a scale of two and if i ask you to fix it you set this to one and then you uh, go here and set this to one and uh, then you go here and you set the height to 100 and that's pretty much solved it so uh, if you can do this you know enough about the scaling of the coordinate systems and pretty much you'll know what the um the object mode does and why you should avoid it when you're modeling and uh, yeah these are examples of the type of tasks each trainer uh, will have their own customized set that uh, are very similar in what they train what they uh, sorry what they are testing some of them will have a, a one very complex scene in which we are required to do many things and others are going to have simplified scenes it depends on how they want to to provide the testing. So I might as well stop sharing my screen now and return this to Simon. <clears throat> now, talking about trainer certification, if you want to become a certified trainer, first of all, you need to pass the test with 100%. Now, the question becomes, what if I get 92%? I've, I've become a certified user. How do I get 100? Well, you have to go and study the topics you missed. Uh, from 92 to 100%, whatever your, your trainer tells you. And uh, then you have to retake a limited time test to prove that you understand those particular topics, the ones you failed. This is the same thing that applies if you fail. Let's say you get 85%, then you fail the certification test, but you can take a limited time test. What we've assessed is that from 75 to 89, you can get away with a limited time test. It could be one hour, it can be two hours, depending on the number of topics. It's a repeat test, and you have to arrange it with your trainer. If you fail with less than 75%, you have to take the full test. 75% of Cinema 4D is, is an indication that you don't know Cinema 4D enough to guarantee that you could be useful in a studio setting. Again, that's sort of the, the way we, we express this. Um, if you're wondering if you are ready, well, we, we do have the online test, which is a, a first step. What I would say, the, the most important thing, first of all, you can't just say, I'm going to go and watch um, uh, a few tutorials or go to a school and take a user certification course for three, five, or nine days, and then I'm ready to take, no. It does, this test requires you to have some sort of experience in Cinema 4D. It's not just knowing what the tools do. It's how you would solve problems based on the knowledge of the tools. So if anyone just picked up Cinema 4D three months ago and they've gone through tutorials and they feel they need a lot, I will guarantee they will fail the test because there will be questions that will require you to put things together or go through very, very specific steps, which uh, you only know if you've used the tools. We are creating more content, and it's uh, part of uh, the, the plan that's coming um, in, in the near future for every single one of the topics. 
if you do want to assess yourselves, go through the topic list and make sure for each and every one of the questions, you you don't have a doubt about what it means. Uh, when we talk about the modeling tools in the mesh menu, um, make sure you know every single one of them. And it's not because you're going to be tested in all of them. It's because it's required for you to do your job properly, to know all the shortcuts you can uh, apply in your work to create what the expected outcome is. And uh, the majority of the tools offer a, a step to do that. So you will, you know, there are things like body paint, which is not used as much as we would have hoped for. It is a requirement, but the requirement for body paint is very low. You need to know it exists. You need to know what is the shortest path to creating a single dab on the on a sphere, for example. But you need to know certain things. For example, uh, UVs cannot, you can't use UV, a UV tag on a an object that's not a mesh object. So if you get a sphere, a primitive sphere, and you want to paint on it, you have to make it editable beforehand. You have to have some sort of UV set in the background. The wizard is the solution for that. So there are certain things where the requirement of knowledge is very low, but you do need to have a general understanding what it means. We even have some topics which are outside of Cinema 4D itself uh, and touch upon very slightly on industry standards. Like people need to know what UDIMs are. We don't have a complete UDIM workflow for UVs, but many studios use it. So it's good to know what it does. A few tangential things is good to know. Generally, what is 3D sculpting? What is 3D painting? Knowing those things and uh, just a very few, a, a little information on, of how these things can be done in Cinema 4D is always beneficial and helps someone be able to provide more solutions in a studio setting. The final thing I want to touch uh, on is, actually I'm going to circle back to becoming a trainer. Once you've hit your 100% mark, uh, with your user certification then in order to become a trainer and this touches upon the whole academic thing i was talking about you are required to take a test a two-hour test in front of two master trainers not to prove that you know what cinema 4d can do you need to prove within two hours that you can teach it there are people that know the tools very well but they cannot teach them efficiently. If you cannot convey that information, you will not be able to become a certified trainer. That's quite unfortunate, but uh, as far as I view it, it's like me, if people saying that, no, you, you can create beautiful art. I cannot, I'm settled with that. I know where my limits are. I can make anything you want me to, as long as you tell me what you want. I cannot come up with, with uh, beautiful images. And the same thing applies to training. You may be an excellent user, you may know everything about Cinema 4D. If you, you don't have the ability to communicate it, you won't be able to become a certified trainer. And to show that ability, you have to provide two hours of training. Sometimes it's going to be, you know, silly questions like, oh, what is that? Or how does this work? Or can you tell us everything you know about the MoGraph cloner? You should be able to come up with enough information to talk about the cloner for two hours. And uh, yeah, that's uh, all I have to say about certified training. The, the other thing is that we can help with this. So if you are interested in becoming either certified or a certified trainer, please get in contact with us because um, as Thanasis has said, it's uh, not the same journey for everyone and it's not necessarily a straight line journey. So contact us training at maxon.net and we can provide suggestions we can help you on the path really and the uh, one of the things you can do of course to prepare yourself that, uh, that ultimate question that you also referenced Thanasis, which is how do i know if i'm ready is that one of the the process is going through that topic list and becoming comfortable with it and then also investigating those different topics and I know you said this already, but it's a balance of bet between study and usage, isn't it? So that um, if if you are if you're passing the test, let's say you did the knowledge test, which by the way, if you get any of the questions wrong on that, it then takes you with links to areas where it explains that topic at more depth. Not just in cinema, by the way, that we because we've got the knowledge test for all the Red Giant products, and also we got Redshift, which is coming very soon. 
which kind of ties in very nicely to our whole Redshift theme that we're doing with the Demystifying Mondays all through June. More on that in a minute. But uh, the takeaway really is just let us see if how we can help. We can make suggestions. We can send you curated lists of tutorials for certain topics and that we want to help you succeed with this. And have you, I know we mentioned it briefly earlier on, but have you any questions that, or comments that is about people who would like to become Cineversity tutorial recorders or artists? Yes. So <clears throat> we're always looking at uh, new content. And uh, we have a very quick process. Um, we try to choose people we, we sort of, we can see their work. We, we know their work. It just, it's a shortcut. Uh, we don't um, spend too much time trying to figure things out. Um, first of all, the the process would be send a few tutorial ideas uh, across to me, and uh, you you can you can use my uh, online uh, form from nurseman.org, and I will reply to you directly. I would prefer uh, if you are confident in tutorial creation. Um, if you haven't done it before. Um, I would say YouTube is free to use. Try it first. Do something that you can actually sit and watch uh, a dozen times and feel that, oh, there's a good flow. And um, again, it's it's a matter of, of managing uh, time. So if you, if you think you can make tutorials and if you've made uh, tutorials, uh, send me a proposal with just the topics of what you would like to do. It could be a, uh, you can send a final render, I can show you the process of how you did this and stuff like that, or a specific uh, workflow or tool, or even industry standard concepts. I have an idea, for example, of how to uh, create high dynamic range panoramas, like with a camera, a tripod, uh, Adobe, or I don't know, uh, Lightroom or whatever software supports that. Um, again, that it, it's not Cinema 4D specific, but it's knowledge that everyone can benefit from. Um, once I, I get the list, um, I will see, oh, this looks interesting, uh, and I will pass it on to our Cineversity coordinator, um, because uh, Michelle is uh, very well versed in what, what's going on, what we're planning, what other tutorials have been planned, so we don't want to have overlaps. And um, if she agrees, which she usually always agrees, um, I'm going to say, okay, for these two topics, do a video by video breakdown with a description of what you're going to show, the tools and all that. So now we have a written version of what the series or tutorial is going to be. And uh, what I ask people, I have a stopwatch here, always hanging next to me. When you're assessing a tutorial, I would assume that you've gone through the process, right? Uh, going through the process means that you do have some sort of um, ballpark uh, figure for your time, how long each tutorial is. All you have to do is start the stopwatch and uh, do your thing and look at the time. That's right? very simple. Uh, that was a tutorial on reading the time on your stopwatch. So once you have that, that goes for final approval to Michelle and then recording starts. The ideal scenario is that if you want to send me a test for sound or something like that, do a 30 second recording uh, once we've uh, set the whole process up. And once you've uh, arranged the financial terms with Michelle, I don't want to know, I don't care. I don't, you know, I wish people can charge a billion dollars a, a millisecond, but so um, I don't participate. Um, no one's gonna make money making tutorials. You're not gonna become rich. What Paul has said, and I think it's very important, we just want you to feel that it's worth your time, all right? We don't want people to make tutorials like, and now you get that bloody sphere and you, yeah, I hate it. <laughs> we don't want tutorials like that. We want people to make tutorials and enjoy doing them, and we want them to be worth their time. So you arrange the financials, and then you record a small part so we can see uh, the, the audio levels and all that kind of stuff. And then the ideal scenario is you record one tutorial at a time. Final, you edit it, sound, everything. You add your title screens and your call outs for the shortcuts and the zooms and everything that's necessary. And then I only watch it. But what I tell people, uh, we use Frame.io for our Cineversity tutorial management. Uh, I would like someone to 
record it, edit it, finalize it, encode it, upload it on Frame.io and watch it on Frame.io. That's where I'm going to watch it because if anything happened during upload and I'm seeing something different, our communication is going to break down. I want the creator to see, to, to, to review the final tutorial on the final uh, platform. The, the minor issue with that is that people, uh, peop, good artists are very busy. So the, the, there's not a lot of time to do these things. If you don't do it, then the, the burden falls on me and I'm very busy as well. So there, there's no, unfortunately, there's no shortcut with these things. Uh, the final review is only to catch any technical mistakes, anything that happened. If you have any questions during the process about a technique or how it works, I will work with you. I've worked with um, a lot of our uh, instructors, including Nick. It took me longer to talk to Nick about certain things than it took Nick to make the tutorial. All right. Uh, you can edit that from the recorded video. But it was uh, it was a joy working with uh, it was a joy working with Nick always. So, <laughs> um, but but you will once we get this process uh, done. If you have uh, questions, uh, I will be willing to work with you. Go on a Skype call, share my screen, show you techniques and so forth. Even if you have an idea of something and you're looking for an optimal way to do that, I will guide you through the process. So yeah, but do as much work as you have to do. And I need to do as little as possible. I, I sell quality, not quantity. Re reverse quantity, yes, exactly. <laughs> the um, keyframe is asking if you have many tutorials but done no certification training, will that affect your chances of being a university trainer? So I, I wouldn't say that that would. That talk to us. That um, we want to hear from you. And similarly, TJ is saying, at what point should we take the elementary knowledge test, the the one hour quiz? And um, the when do when do we know we're ready for taking that, and what we know what we know and what we know what we don't know. Um, the the short answer is you can take that multiple times, and then that just taking the tests famously also increases your knowledge, but also the the fact that then it suggests areas of uh, the study, and also contact us as well. I, I know I've mentioned it before, but we want to hear from you. So training at maxon.net. And that comes to all of us. So we, we can help you through this whole process. I do have a clue. I do have a clue. Even if you don't know something, if you watch a tutorial and you have no idea what's going on, if you watch a tutorial on Cineversity, on my channel, on the Maxon Training channel, on the Ask the Trainer, if you're watching something and you have no idea what's going on, that means you have gaps in your fundamental knowledge. Because what you're learning in a tutorial is one thing, but the fundamentals it's built on is something you need to understand. So if you find any of the topics you're watching, for example, Ellie's showing these fantastic Fui stuff, uh, uh, the breaking up cars and all that. If part of what she did uh, brings up a question mark, that means you need to find out what that is and start looking into that particular thing where you, you lost track of what the tutorial was talking about. So watching tutorials is not only about learning, it's about identifying how much of the fundamental knowledge you're lacking in order to take it the, to the next step so that the tutorial teaches you everything it can teach you. And that's another way of understanding how much of, uh, you know, of, of Cinema 4D you know. And when you get to the point where you watch my tutorials and you identify mistakes, you get, you're, you're ready to take the test. <laughs> yeah, that's right. You get the secret tutorial unlocking challenge. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you so much for this. This, I mean, there's a lot of information there, a lot, lot to unpack, but we can, as we mentioned much earlier on, we can help you with it with memory joggers, such as that whole series of tutorials about making tutorials, as well as explainers about the, the, to the certification process as well. So just go on to Maxon Training Team, and then also go on to Athanasis's site um, on YouTube as well, and we'll put all these links in the follow-up email and also we'll put them in the descriptions in the YouTube on the YouTube channel itself. Fantastic. I'm just replying sorry I'm replying to uh, Tim Lee uh, he's asking uh, or she's asking uh, uh, they're asking see I'm, I'm, I'm gonna make uh, is there any are there any good tutorials for Python for Cinema 4D um, and I'm sending my reply is that 
um, there is someone that's dedicated a lot of part or a big part of their lives in doing tutorials. It's Kyrin, uh, C A I R Y N, um, to be found um, on I think CG Society in Core 4D. Um, I will post a link to. All right, so uh, Simon, uh, keep talking. I'll find it. I'll find. I'll post a link for. Simon, fill for me. <laughs> yeah, say, say something. You, you know I can. <laughs> Would um, any of the other rest of the panel want to throw in their comments about what we've discussed? Any takeaways that you've found useful over the years? Or some encouragement, things that, that you used to find were difficult and then how you overcame that? Or, or none of the above? It's, <laughs> anything you want to throw in just before we wrap up? Was that a question for me? No, it's a question for everyone else except you. Because oh, I'm not listening, so I, I have no idea what you asked. I, I actually had a quick question for uh, Thanasis and Dr. Sassy. I'm just curious. So this is a quick question. Have you ever Googled yourself? Sorry, have you ever Googled uh, a Cinema 4D topic and ended up on your own video? As the explanation. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I have. And it's sometimes funny, even uh, when I search something, I end up finding things that were already supplied on Cineversity and even if I've watched every single tutorial there, over 4,000, sometimes I forget, oh, there was one. And I, I have a slightest idea, but um, just to add to that, Simon asked, do you want to add something? And I would think the most important part that I would love to see in every tutorial is the information flow from the start to finish. Explain how numbers and things go from A to C. If you can do that, you have understood the whole thing and your audience will do so as well. Great advice. TJ's found the link for you, by the way, Vanessis. Oh, okay. I sent, I, I published the, um, the Patreon link to Kyron. Okay. Yeah, yeah, uh, and uh, he's doing an excellent job. He's uh, very knowledgeable. He helps users a lot um, on his own time, and I think he's planning to write a book about Cinema 4D and Python. So that's going to be interesting. I would say spend a few bucks and support um, creators like him uh, because it's worth. You are going to get a return on your payment for five bucks a, a month. It's worth spending a few months learning the stuff but anyhow i'm not going to tell you what to do just go and do it <laughs> yes that's right excellent thanks so much for all this and thank you everyone for bearing with us and allowing us to go long i know but 60 minutes or 90 minutes is the new 60 minutes isn't it you know this by now but thanks dr sassy thanks nick thanks ellie and thank you Vanessis, for all your thank wisdom thank you um, simon not only now but over the years Thank you all for being here. Thank you all the uh, everyone who uh, attended. Uh, find me on social at nosemangr. Uh, and if you have any uh, particular questions, just go to noseman.org and use the form, and I will reply to, directly. Excellent, and thanks everyone for all the the nice comments. Thank you for the thank yous. <laughs> <laughs> Cool. Okay, we'll see you again. Just oh, I can't not say this, can I? Look, we'll see you again tomorrow. If you are doing anything around 10 a.m., here we go. We can find where this is. 10 a.m. Pacific tomorrow. Please come and join Seth and Hashi, where they're kicking off on their VFX and chill talk show. So essentially, they do 90 minutes of just taking apart. A, a show or an effect that they've seen in a movie or a TV program, and then just seeing how they can recreate that. And we knowing those two individuals, it's going to be a lot of fun um, yep. and much humor involved too. And it's funny how it can be so entertaining at the same time, uh, so informative. Yeah. yeah, that exact thing we were talking about. So just warning, you might learn something, but you will be entertained. <laughs> I think that's the proper way around. Excellent. Okay. Thank you so much, everyone. And we'll see you on the next one of these. All right. Bye. Bye. Bye.